Kwaisa. This is James, aka JP Harker, coming to you with another video. This one is about a research book that I've been reading. I shall hold up here. It is The Greatest Night, The Remarkable Life of William Marshall, The Power Behind Five English Thrones. Realistically four, but we'll go into that. Uh, it's by Thomas Asbridge. Now, I was always sort of predisposed to like this, because well, firstly I I like the Plantagenets, and that's the time this is happening. Secondly, I like Wales, and he's the Earl of Pembroke. Uh, thirdly, I like knights. But also, um, I love his home, or rather, his power base home, because he didn't live there much, which is Pembroke Castle. I've been there many times. I absolutely love it there. It's one of my favourite castles to visit. I'd recommend it, go stay in Tenby, visit Pembroke, it's lovely. But that sort of, it was sort of inevitable that I was going to like him, and a book on him, it was just fascinating. First off, it was well written, it was engaging, it's done in these nice, sort of, not short, but manageable little chunks within the chapters. So if you're doing like I do, and you're reading when you can, sort of reading it, breakfast or lunch or reading before you go to bed. It's very nice for that. You can get a little chunk done and not be overwhelmed. But also, you see, the stuff in it is fascinating. I knew a little bit about William Marshall. Keep this up. I knew a little bit about him before I started this. But I only really knew him as a man who made himself, not quite from nothing, but as a second son of a lesser lord, and he made himself into something quite prominent in the rulership of England, and that he became involved in Magna Carta. I think that's what most people know as. There's a statue of him in the House of Lords holding Magna Carta. So I knew that much, and I knew he was the model from which a lot of people get the idea of knighthood from early on. And it's what uh, Barristan Selmy is based on in Game of Thrones slash Song of Ice and Fire. But I didn't know much about his life and how he got to all these places. And I did also love all the details about the Angevin dynasty that's in here. So I shall start off, I'll keep it reasonably brief, because I'm keeping my videos brief. Starts off as the lesser son of this lesser lord, and his father did not care very much for him, and wasn't willing to pay a ransom for him when he was a boy. Sent him off to be squire is a later term, but to be sort of raised in a knightly household of a friend of the family, and he grew up there and got into the tournament circuit. Tournaments being a very different thing back then, it wasn't pageantry and two people jousted each other with lances. It was a mock battle that took place over sort of a space a mile long. It was little groups of knights fighting each other, and it was real training for war. So. He rises to prominence on this tournament circuit, partly because he's a big fella for his time. He's well over six foot tall, which for the 1160s, I believe it is, that's pretty damn tall. But also he was a very devoted and skilled man. He was dedicated to his training and he was clever. He learned early on how to utilise tactics, which was exactly what tournaments were there for. So he became prominent in that and became close to Henry the Young King. Little technicality in the title when it says power behind five English thrones. One, he wasn't really a power behind Henry the Second, but Henry the Young King wasn't really a king on the throne. That's kind of the whole point. Henry the Young King, for them as don't know, was the eldest son of Henry the Second and was crowned during Henry the Second's lifetime to make sure there was going to be no dissent among his sons, because he had some argumentative sons, so he thought, during my life I'll crown my eldest, and no one can then argue who the heir is, because there wasn't a uh, primogeniture rule at the time. Unfortunately, young Henry was... People say, oh, he was vain, and he was selfish, and he was cocky, and he was greedy, and he probably was all of those things. But he was understandably ambitious for a man who's been told you're a king. And Henry didn't give him any real authority, didn't give him any real role to play. So while Richard is busy being Duke of Aquitaine, 
and Geoffrey is being made uh, at the Duke of Count Brittany, Henry the young king, who's been told you're a king, doesn't have any real responsibility, doesn't even have much in the way of an income of his own. So he gets quite resentful and leads rebellions against his father, just like Richard does, just like John joins in on. And it's interesting seeing more of his point of view. Most of what I've read about young Henry, it's how dreadful he is and how irresponsible he is. It's interesting seeing from the perspective of someone who was within his inner circle, even though there was a bit of a rift but that was made up and etc etc. But it starts off a precedent for how William Marshall works, which is he was loyal to the bitter end, even when things were going badly. And that is one of the things that really worked well for him all through his career. And in his later life, he traded on that reputation well. Even after Henry the Young King had lost everything and was dying and everything had gone horribly, horribly wrong, everyone's abandoning him, William Marshall stays loyal. Later when Henry II is losing wars and he's getting old and he's dying and it's all going wrong and people are abandoning him, William Marshall remains loyal. And he remains loyal to Richard and he remains loyal to John, even though John is a dreadful human being who didn't treat Marshall particularly well. It's this partly this chivalric idea of loyalty, partly he's not a fool and he knows that this reputation for loyalty is good for him. William Marshall keeps this going, he keeps this ideal going. And whether that's for good reasons or bad reasons, it sets an example and it's one of the reasons he's still well known as this chivalric ideal. So I've gone on a little bit but that's something I found interesting. I found his personality interesting. They go into a little depth about it because we all like this perfect knight, this greatest knight persona, but it does show he wasn't above being a little sneaky now and then. He wasn't above grasping for promotion when it was available, and he wasn't above realising it's not just about my personal honour and dignity. This reputation I'm cultivating is useful, and it really, really was. When he got to the point where he was essentially running England, and, as I say, was involved in Magna Carta and was putting the very young Henry III into power, it was that reputation as much as anything else. Because yes, he was rich and he was powerful, but lots of people were rich and powerful. It was this thing that he could trade on, and that people could deal with him in good faith, which they couldn't with John. So I found that interesting, that he had this ideal, but it wasn't necessarily for the right reasons, we don't know. Another little thing I found interesting that I didn't know was his wife, Isabel de Clare. We all know the de Clares, of course, uh, martial lords in Wales, very, very rich and powerful. And I haven't appreciated how much he valued her input and her counsel. More and more when he's off fighting in Ireland, or when he's trying to stay on the good side of John, there's frequent references to him asking his wife her opinion and asking her to keep an eye on things. And the various sort of lesser lords and knights who were gathered around him they're also listening to what she has to say. And I had always assumed she was just a means to an end because she was an heiress and she was his way of getting into more power and more wealth. I hadn't appreciated that she was someone who he valued in the way that he did and who, after his death, she mourned him very, very sincerely. And he was clearly very emotionally close to his children. Hey, you don't see that much in aristocratic men of this time. So I, I know I've banged on about it, but it is interesting to see that you've got this paragon of virtues who isn't really a paragon of virtues, and yet you then see him do things that are very paragon of virtue and you see him be unusually noble, but there's... is he doing it for the right... I don't know... It's... it's what made it interesting. He's very, very human, and he's very, very complicated. And I just really liked that. I loved 
the idealism, I loved the complexity, I loved the historical context, and as I say, it's well written. So, I've sort of gushed about this for long enough, I think. The Greatest Night by Thomas Asbridge. I would highly recommend this if you're at all interested in the beginnings of chivalry, or in medieval history, or even just a well-written bit of historical documentary over an individual's life. I'd recommend it. I would go out and buy it. Yes, I know I got it. Buy one, get one half price, but that's just me. I would recommend this. Very much so. Oh, I think I shall leave this glowing praise at that. The Greatest Night, the story of William Marshall. Very, very good. It's made me want to learn even more about him if I can, and I will recommend it to pretty much anybody. So, on that note, this is James, a.k.a. J.P. Harker. Well, well.